Ashwini. Ash Oswell is a neurologist um, who has got MRC funding and is going to talk to us about updates uh, on surgery, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's. Thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm a clinician scientist and neurologist and uh, I look after patients undergoing uh, deep brain stimulation surgery uh, in addition to uh, patients with Parkinson's disease as well. Um, and uh, like all great medical innovations, uh, deep brain stimulation um, came about um, to the field about sort of 30 years ago, largely through trial and error, uh, also known as research. Um, <laughs> and um, really what I'm going to focus on is um, how uh, research over the past 30 years has uh, really transformed this treatment into a treatment that is safe, effective, um, and uh, a treatment that can be used for an increasing uh, proportion of the uh, population of patients with Parkinson's disease. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, a few select uh, advances in DBS therapy, uh, and particularly the role of imaging um, and how this has helped to make uh, DBS safer. I'm also going to talk about uh, new technologies and new ways of stimulation, uh, new ways of delivering the stimulation, which include uh, directional stimulation um, and uh, the idea of uh, sensing-enabled devices. So these are devices that, in addition to stimulating, can potentially stimulate a bit more intelligently, and they do so by first sensing the signal they record and then uh, making decisions about how to deliver the stimulation. And in relation to this is also the important uh, concept of personalized therapies. So if we can uh, sense a signal in an individual patient's brain, we can then deliver a therapy in a much more personalized way. And then I'm also going to touch upon uh, some exploratory targets and other indications for deep brain stimulation that have largely been considered in a research setting. Um, and then finally, uh, move on to um, some of the research that we do uh, in Parkinson's disease at the MRC Brain Network Dynamics Unit. So, as we all, I'm, I'm sure, uh, know by now, given uh, today's talks, Parkinson's disease is characterized by the loss of uh, neurons in the brain that produce uh, this chemical called dopamine, and that then leads to a prodrome before the illness is manifest. Um, and traditionally, it's been thought that um, after initial therapies such as levodopa, dopamine agonists, and other tablets, one might then move on to an advanced therapy, and, and, and deep brain stimulation has traditionally been considered to be one of these advanced therapies. Now, the basic premise of deep brain stimulation is that there are movement networks in the brain, uh, and I won't talk about these in detail, but this is just a little diagram showing the various structures in the brain that are responsible for movement. Um, and in Parkinson's disease, these structures aren't really working as they should be. They're not sort of communicating information to other areas as they should be. So um, it's been thought that by electrically stimulating these areas, we might be able to boost movements and, uh, and improve movement. So, 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 so what deep brain stimulation involves is a surgical procedure to insert these electrodes into uh, very focused areas in the brain so that you can stimulate them with electrical current. And actually what we're doing is targeting very small brain areas. So you can see in the red here the, the electrode being put into a very small brain area. And this, this involves a very special type of surgery called a stereotactic surgery. Um, and uh, just to sort of explain what this means, because we're targeting very small areas, what we need is a map. Um, and uh, when patients undergo this surgery, uh, a frame is uh, inserted or, or placed upon the head, um, and this really acts as a map, uh, and more importantly, a coordinate system on the map to allow you to target very small structures in the brain. So I'm just going to show you a video of uh, the, the sort of very striking effects that deep brain stimulation can have on symptoms. And there are a few areas in medicine and, and very few areas in neurology, I think, where a treatment can have such rapid and marked effects. So this is a video of, of a patient when his stimulator is initially turned off. And I'm sure you can sort of all appreciate that he's in a particularly bad way when it comes to his movements. So he's actually freezing and struggling to walk. And there's quite a bit of tremor also.
And then when his stimulator is turned on, he's, he's really, uh, in many ways, a different person. Yeah, so, so, so you, know, you know, what we like to see is a large proportion of patients benefit in this way from, uh, from DBS surgery, uh, and a large proportion do. Uh, obviously, this surgery also, uh, like any other major surgery, has risks. Uh, but what I'd like to um, also convey is that there can be quite sort of prolonged effects uh, of deep brain stimulation surgery on the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So this sort of slightly complicated um, diagram here shows that even at five years and at eight to 11 years, many of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease are much better than they are um, at baseline. So this sort of line at 100% indicates uh, the baseline level, uh, and after five to ten years, there's still improvement seen in UPDRS scores, tremor, slowness of movement, um, and uh, levodopa equivalent doses. So, so there are sort of prolonged effects of deep brain stimulation surgery, and this has really led many people to uh, question whether deep brain stimulation might be neuroprotective in some way, um, and whether we should even offer it um, early on in Parkinson's disease. But these are still open questions in the field. So in terms of thinking about some of the advances of deep brain stimulation, um, imaging has been very helpful. And what we can do now with uh, many uh, new software techniques is to look at the um, electrode reconstructions from many patients in a common template space. So why this is useful is because we can then look at how targeting specific parts of a particular brain area, in this case the subthalamic nucleus, can impact the outcome of deep brain stimulation surgery. So what we're trying to find is the best area to target that maximally improves symptoms. And in addition to um, having just the structural imaging, we can combine this with other modalities like tractography. So what tractography tells us is the white matter connections between different brain areas. So we can then ask um, which areas of the subthalamic nucleus that are best connected to other brain areas should we target when we're implanting these electrodes. And we can also use um, additional approaches such as actually directly sort of modelling or calculating the volume of activated tissue, which is the tissue that's kind of activated during uh, electrical stimulation, and then looking at the um, connections of that volume of activated tissue to other brain areas. And some of the recent research really has shown that we can, uh, if, we best, if we target parts of the subthalamic nucleus that are connected to these motor areas, uh, we achieve the best outcomes. And also what I, what I particularly like to see is the fact that um, using, using data across lots of patients, we can identify sweet spots. Uh, these are areas that if we target and stimulate, uh, are associated with the greatest uh, motor improvement and greatest clinical benefit. And a very recent paper that was only published a few weeks ago actually has shown that if you target the sweet spot shown in red here, you might actually slow down motor progression in Parkinson's disease. So again, this is supporting the idea that um, well-placed DBS electrodes might have some uh, neuroprotective effects. Nextly, I'm just going to touch upon, briefly upon directional stimulation. Um, so this has been another recent advance in the field. Uh, traditionally, um, a DBS electrode is, uh, usually have, would have about four contacts. But nowadays, the electrodes have many more uh, contacts. So these are small portions that you can uh, stimulate in different ways. Uh, and what that means is that rather than sort of stimulating uh, homogeneously, you can deliver a very sort of inhomogeneous or, uh, or, or, or steered field uh, and steer the current in particular locations to uh, maximize um, the efficacy and reduce side effects. So for example, in this case, if there is an electrode in this particular part of the subthalamic nucleus with a very old DBS device, you, you would be sort of activating a much larger volume of tissue, and you might be sort of activating regions that are associated with side effects. But with the newer um, types of uh, electrode, you can 
uh, steer that current away from areas that could be associated with side effects. Now, the jury's still out as to whether these technologies actually uh, benefit patients and, and improve symptoms and side effects, but there is some evidence that's beginning to uh, grow with time. So another important thing about deep brain stimulation is that traditionally what we tend to do is deliver a constant, um, constant current and the stimulation is there all the time at a fixed frequency um, and it's kind of ignorant of a patient's underlying state. So for example, if they're sleeping or it's ignorant of the, the brain rhythms that might be sort of um, occurring in the background of the area where the electrode is. So with the newer sensing-enabled devices, you can actually kind of record the brain rhythms from the, using the same electrode that we're delivering the stimulation with. And by recording the brain rhythms, you can then sort of think, think about stimulation more intelligently and, and give stimulation only when it's required. So some of the newer DBS devices, uh, including the Percept device, have a capacity to sense uh, signals before stimulation, um, and these are being used more and more uh, in our clinical practice. And as these sensing-enabled devices become rechargeable, uh, I think we'll be transitioning to a point where they're implanted uh, in all eligible patients. So, in order to de deliver stimulation in an intelligent way, what we really need is a biomarker. And a biomarker is something that tells us that uh, the disease is getting worse or progressing, or that some symptom is about to appear. And what we're dealing with here, because we're recording uh, signals in time, are, are very short biomarkers. So th these are biomarkers that last for very short periods of time, um, and they disappear after a few hundred milliseconds, for example. So this is, rather than a continuous biomarker, this is a short-lived or transient biomarker. And it turns out that there is a particular type of activity that we see uh, in the brains of patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, and this activity is a, a, a frequency of around about 20 hertz. And it's sort of technically known as a beta burst. And what deep brain stimulation is thought to do is to suppress this uh, activity that occurs at frequencies below 20 hertz. So what the newer DBS devices are now starting to do is to record this activity, then when it comes on, to start stimulating in order to suppress it. So rather than delivering stimulation continuously, what you can do is sort of record the signal, decide if a burst is present or not, and then deliver stimulation in an intelligent way. And I'm just going to sort of show you an example here of a sensing-enabled device and how this could be used to deliver stimulation intelligently. So here, here we've got a patient with Parkinson's disease who has an electrode implanted quite deep in the brain in the subthalamic nucleus, but we're also recording from the superficial areas of his brain that control movement that, that are called the motor cortex. So in the top panel here on the right, we can see the signal from the motor cortex, and on the bottom panel, we can see the signal from deeper in the brain. And what we can see is that he's got this sort of activity at around about 20 hertz deep in the brain, but nothing in the more superficial areas. And he's sort of sitting at rest here, but very shortly something, something different happens. So you can start to see he's becoming very dyskinetic. And actually those dyskinesias are associated with the emergence of uh, this activity here in the brain at kind of higher frequencies. So this is just a demonstration of how sensing-enabled devices might allow you to track symptoms in real time. And then I, I was sort of previously talking about um, intelligent stimulation. So in, in the field, this is known as adaptive deep brain stimulation. And th th this video is just to, just to give you um, an idea of what exactly it's doing. So it's recording, what we're doing here is recording the signal and we're looking specifically at the activity at 20 hertz, the beta frequencies, and then when it exceeds a threshold, we're delivering the current. So the current is only kind of coming up when that activity is exceeding a threshold. 
So it's a, it's a more intelligent stimulation that, that delivers stimulation based on the underlying rhythms that are recorded. And this has come out a bit small, unfortunately, but what we can see is um, motor improvements with stimulation. Um, with conventional deep brain stimulation and this more intelligent adaptive deep brain stimulation. And, and we can see that there is a significant change with um, the intelligent uh, stimulation delivery in motor function. A and similarly, looking at speech side effects, uh, conti continuous deep brain stimulation, which is the conventional approach, does much worse than uh, adaptive deep brain stimulation here. So one of the things that um, we've been doing some research into is whether we might be able to improve uh, on adaptive deep brain stimulation. So this is a bit like um, kind of a thermostat. So in a, in a sort of temperature control system in your house, you've got a thermostat that kind of adjusts the heating based on the temperature that you record. Here we're trying to adjust the stimulation based on the signal that we record from uh, the subthalamic nucleus. So we, we've, got the, we've got the burst shown here, and, and what adaptive deep brain stimulation will do is to start delivering stimulation af after a delay, because there's a delay that, kind of, that exists from sensing and decision about whether or not to stimulate. So all of this uh, process about sensing and deciding whether or not to stimulate introduces a delay. And, and we feel that in a system such as the brain, having even a relatively short delay of a few hundred milliseconds um, might not be ideal. So what we've been trying to do is to act rather than kind of um, record a signal, to decide to stimulate and stimulate, to actually sort of see if we can predict when these bursts occur. So predict when the activity that slows down movement occurs before it even occurs. And that might allow us to be much faster in making the decision about whether or not to stimulate. So in this case, what, we, what we're actually doing is kind of feeding some of the data that occurs before a burst into a neural network. Um, and neural networks are sort of quite ubiquitous now, and you may have heard about them um, in the news, in um, chatbots such as ChatGPT, but also uh, they might be found more commonly in your iPhone in fingerprint recognition and face recognition. And what we're doing is to try and use this neural network to predict when a burst will occur based on the past history of the data that we record. And it turns out that for um, individual patients, we can do this with quite high sensitivity uh, and, and also specificity. So this might be useful because it might allow us to deliver stimulation much more quickly using less energy um, and you know, that would in turn mean that it could result in fewer side effects. Finally, I'm just going to briefly discuss some exploratory targets. Um, so classically, cognitive impairment or dementia has been considered a no-no for deep brain stimulation. Uh, we've previously had a trial uh, looking at stimulation, uh, stimulating various areas in the brain's memory network to see if these might um, help to alleviate some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease dementia. The, the, the trial number has been quite small, so it's been very difficult to make any sort of firm conclusions about this. Uh, but what we can certainly say is that the approach has been safe and tolerated uh, in all of the patients who, who thus far took part. In terms of the research that we're doing at the Brain Network Dynamic <coughs> Unit, um, this is just a schematic to show that the, the different um, uh, approaches that are being used and leveraged. So through biomedical engineering, uh, we're developing newer stimulation approaches and newer stimulation devices, such as the Dynamo, which has been led by Tim Dennison. Um, and that is a device that, that can titrate stimulation based on circadian rhythms and movement states. Uh, we're also doing research into uh, the foundational neuroscience and the effects that DBS has on brain networks and linking this through to clinical translation. And ultimately, what we'd like to see is that all of this research might be used to deliver stimulation in a less invasive or even a non-invasive way. Um, and thank you. And uh, just a, a very last point, at the Brain Network Dynamics Unit, we're looking for uh, patients to uh, help us in our research goals and to form uh, potentially a patient advisory group. So if anybody does want to get in touch, 
uh, then uh, we would welcome any approaches. Thanks.